Home is where the heart is. It's somewhere safe, where I feel comfortable enough to be myself. It's tea in my favourite mug, gardening in my pyjamas, somewhere to relax and lie low. It's security, memories, warmth, fun, contentment. It's love. It's family. If I'm with my family, anywhere's home. And it's a place that's safe to leave behind sometimes, because it's always there to go back to. But what if it wasn't? Imagine how you would feel if tomorrow you had to leave your home and your family because it wasn't safe to stay. Who would you turn to? Where would you go? How, how would you cope? Would you cope? For many people around the world, home isn't a safe place, and they have to run away. In many countries, people may be put in prison, seriously hurt, or even killed, simply because of who they are. Maybe because of their race. Their religion. Their culture they come from what they think about politics or the kind of person they are when someone runs away from their home country because they believe it is not safe for them to stay they become an, an asylum, asylum seeker. seeker they are looking for somewhere to live where they can be safe everyone in the world has the right to seek asylum. Because everyone in the world has the right to find a safe place to live. The U N H C R The, the what? what? The United Nations I Commission for Refugees It's a group of countries who work together to make sure that everyone in the world can find a safe place to live. When an asylum seeker arrives in a new country, they must prove to the government that they are in danger in their home country. If the government believes them, they give them permission to stay and the person becomes a refugee. It can take a long time to prove that your story is true. And while you wait, you, you cannot, cannot work. work. But what kind of people are asylum seekers? The newspapers and politicians always seem to have lots to say about them. But what are they really like? Let's meet some. We're going to introduce you to some people who had to run away from their home country because they were in danger. The stories you are about to hear are true. They have been shared with us by real people who live in this city of Bradford. The words you will hear are theirs. Sharing your story isn't easy. We hope you will respect that as you listen and think about what you are hearing. My name is Jora. I am 15 years old and we are six children in our family. My parents ran away from Burma and lived in Nayapara, a Bangladesh refugee camp for 18 years. That's where I was born. My parents ran away because we are Rohingyans. This is the ethnic group that we belong to. In Burma, my home country, my people may be attacked, tortured or even killed simply because of who we are. My name is Michael. I come from Zimbabwe. I came to the UK because my daughter, who was a nursing student at a London university, wasn't well. I came to take her back to Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, I worked as a teacher and a lecturer. The government there didn't like some of the things I was saying or writing. I didn't know it yet, but my life was in danger. 
My name is Richard. I am not an asylum seeker or a refugee, but I work with a lot of people who are. One day I met a man called William at the Refugee Council in Leeds. I had arrived in London. London. But the Immigration Service sent me to Leeds. And they sent me to Liverpool. Liverpool. In the meantime, I had nowhere to stay except on Leeds Station. I couldn't speak English, but Richard took me home to Bradford. Bradford. I rang my friend Judy, who could speak French. Bonjour! And I joined them for a meal. When he arrived here, Michael found that his daughter was too ill to travel. He decided to look after her here, but sadly she didn't survive her illness. After my daughter was buried, May she rest in peace. Amen. Amen. I was told it was no longer safe for me to go back to Zimbabwe because of things I'd written, the things I'd done. I was forced to become an asylum seeker. In the refugee camp where Jorah was born, more than 1,000 people lived without shelter, clean water or electricity. Sometimes we did not have food. All children did not have shoes or clothes to wear because of extreme poverty. Although he had to stay here, Michael didn't know much about life in this England. When we got into the country, we begin to find it's not only safety which is important in life. There are other things that I faced. First and foremost, the problem was, what will I eat? Where would I sleep? And what would I wear? My country is very warm. You can sleep out in the open. The clothes I brought here were not really suitable. I needed clothes that were warm. And you can't sleep outside here. It's very cold. Over our meal, William told us his story. He had been beaten, then put in jail for being part of a political party that was against the government. While William was in prison, his brother was killed by government soldiers. After my brother's death, the local village priest was convinced that I would be killed next. He took the four day journey to the prison where I was being held and he bribed an official to get me released. The priest who helped William gave him photos of his brother's dead body to help him to prove his story, then arranged for him to leave the country on a flight to Heathrow in England. These people Michael, Jorah and William have all faced terrible things in their home countries. But when they run and arrive here, what kind of a welcome do they get? It seems to me that out of all the needy people in our city, asylum seekers have the worst of everything. Everyone seems against them. The government. The press. Most, Most of, the of the public. public. But they come here seeking sanctuary. I believe we should provide for them. Life in the refugee camp in Bangladesh was hard for Jora and her family. Children did not have the right to education. There were thousands of small huts all together and each family had two small rooms with terrible conditions. Without windows, very hot. When Michael first arrived in England to take care of his daughter, there was a Zimbabwean family that offered to keep them both for a month. But after that month, they were no longer able to look after me. I was forced to look for places to stay. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know there were organisations that could help. So, 
I was forced to sleep rough. We were not allowed to go outside the refugee camp because if people found out we were from the Rohingya community, then they would kill us. Many people got killed and many were experiencing terrible torture. As a child of my age, I saw horrible things. The Rohingya people died in my presence. I was traumatized and all the time I was scared of going outside. I am still remembering all of these bad memories. Do you know what it means to sleep rough? It means going to stay in a park. It means sleeping under a bush. I did that for a month. I didn't know that close to where I was spending my nights, there was a church. And in the church, there were people who were willing to take me in. When I discovered that, they were able to keep me for two months and I could sleep in the church. After we'd eaten together, William showed us the photos of his brother's dead body and wept. My brother's coffin had been deliberately left open so that people could see the torture that had been inflicted on him by the authorities. Then, to show us how badly he had been beaten, William took off his shirt and we saw the scars on his back. Michael didn't know about how to claim asylum or even that he needed to. You know what the problem is? Some of these things may be written in books, but if you've not done them before, you look like you're unwise. When it comes to the real thing, you need somebody to tell you even the simple things, like, where do we claim asylum? When Michael decided to claim asylum, he went to Liverpool because he was told that people claimed asylum there. But the people in Liverpool said, We don't take asylum seekers here. You must go to London, to a place called Croydon. I didn't have the bus fare to go from Liverpool to London. And even if I got to London, I didn't know where Croydon was. Because London, let me tell you, it has a population of about 8 million people. 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 And if you ask people where Croydon is, one will point to the north, the other one will point to the south, the next one will point to the west, and the rest will point to the east. Anyway, I was able to get to London, and with the help of map, because maps are free in London, I was able to get a train to Croydon, where I claimed asylum. It must be very hard to know how to claim asylum in a country that's not your own. Imagine standing up in court against a government solicitor when you speak little English. Don't understand the system and are probably traumatised by what you've been through. But there are organisations that can help. I help asylum seekers to prepare their case for the Asylum Tribunal in Bradford. I'm not legally trained, but I help them present their case and go with them to support them. After we'd spoken to him, William was anxious to know if his family were safe back in his home country. We offered him a phone so he could call his wife. The village priest had not yet returned from helping me to escape. My wife had heard no news and thought I was already dead. When William managed to speak to her, more tears came, but this time they were tears of joy. Although there wasn't much education for Jorah in the refugee camp, the children there began receiving basic lessons. One day when I was in class, 
something came in my mind. I thought that if only one day I could have the chance of going to high education and becoming a big lady to save my Rohingya people. One day they had a test. Shh! And Jora got a good mark. I was chosen to do IT and other programs for six months. And when I finished the training, I got certificates which allowed me to teach other people in my community. Class dismissed. You must eat before you go claim asylum. They interviewed me for three hours without food, without a break. They didn't allow me to move. They asked me questions. They couldn't believe me. I told them that I was a lecturer. Then they said, Nah, how could a lecturer fail to know where to stay? I told them that I was a writer, that I'd written books for schools, for secondary schools. They say, Nah, it must be your brother. For three hours, I was asked all questions. I answered them. How many sisters do you have? Where do you live? How many children do your sisters have? What about your brothers? How many sisters, How many sisters do, you do, you do you have? Where do you live? How many children, How many children do, your, do your sisters have? What about your brothers? How many, How many sisters, sisters where do, you do, you have? Have? do you have? Where do you live? How, How many, many children, children do, do your sisters, sisters, sisters have? have? What about your brothers? About your brothers? All these things they asked. After that, I was surprised. Then they said, All right. We're going to look at all these things you have told us. It takes about three weeks. But you are not going anywhere. We are going to keep you for those three weeks. I said, what? Yes. They took me into a bus. They took me to a town called Margate. It's very close to France, right at the end of England. Very, very close to France. I was put into a hotel with hundreds of other refugees while I waited to hear them make a decision. After three weeks, they told me. We don't really believe you. But we're going to find out. So they are going to place me in a new place for two years whilst they find out the truth about me. If we find out we believe you, then we will give you asylum. And you know what? They took me to this place, Bradford. And you know what? Instead of two years, it took them six, six years. years to find out before they allowed me to stay as a refugee. So it's not an easy journey to get refugee status. It's a very long and a very difficult one. One day, Jora's parents told her that their family had been chosen by the UNHCR to come and live in the UK as refugees. I was very happy and in December 2009, we came to the UK. I was happy to live in proper and furnished house with gas, electricity, water, toilet, kitchen for the first time. My brothers and sisters have the right for education and health care. After I'd spoken to my wife, we all hugged each other and I asked my new friends to pray with me. I prayed with passion, thanking God and offering myself to the Lord. After William had thanked us thoroughly, he went to his room, where we heard him pray throughout the night. The next morning, after a breakfast full of smiles and broken French, Merci, mon ami. Je suis un chauffeur. Richard took William to the station. After six years of waiting, Michael finally had refugee status, which meant he was allowed to find a job at last. But it wasn't that simple. Waiting for six years is 
very, very difficult. You lose your original identity and your profession. Although I was a lecturer for many years, after six years of waiting, I, I didn't know where to start. I'd lost six years, six of the best part of my life. Now, I'm just an old man. So you see, when you become a refugee, you must be prepared to wait. Now, I am very happy here as I can go to school where I'm learning many subjects. My parents can go to Houghton Training Centre to learn English. And I have many friends at school and very good neighbours who are also helping. My parents are happy here as they can take their children to the park and playground. All people talk to us nicely. A few months after meeting William, we got a phone call. I wanted them to know that I was doing well and I was grateful for the welcome they had shown me. I told him that it was us who were grateful. It had been a real blessing to meet him and to witness such faith. Michael doesn't have anyone else in England. His daughter passed away and from time to time he goes down to see her grave. In Zimbabwe, they have big families. His mother gave birth to nine children. He has five brothers and three sisters back home. Say cheese. Cheese. I also had my own big family. I tried really hard, but I ended up with four daughters. Three of them are married and they have their own families back in Zimbabwe. Sometimes Michael's family have big get-togethers. Just last month, there was a wedding. And everybody was asking, Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? But they couldn't find me. They couldn't find me because I'm here as a refugee. I communicate regularly with my family. That doesn't change the fact that I'm here alone, as a refugee. To me, these people are no longer just asylum seekers who have come here, but friends I have come to know. I enjoy their company and I'm inspired by all they've achieved. But I wonder whether they can ever truly feel at home here. Although we are happy here in the UK, we still have relatives living in Bangladesh refugee camp. When we speak to them, we become very sad, thinking about the hard times in the camp. I wish they could have the chance of being taken by the UNHCR one day. I want to go back to my country tomorrow if I can. But the problem is, I asked to be a refugee because the political situation in my country is still very, very hard. When the time comes, I may be able to go back home, but there's no guarantee. I may never be able to get down, down to Zimbabwe. Please don't believe all that you read in the newspapers or hear from politicians about asylum seekers and refugees. Try and meet some, and then you will discover we are ordinary people who just want somewhere we can be safe. Somewhere we can work towards achieving our hopes and dreams. Like Jorah. My family and I are grateful to the UK government for giving us space to live. I want to focus on my studies, going to university and one day to achieve my dream of becoming someone who could help the Rohingya community. I would say to anyone listening to this, when you meet someone who is an asylum seeker, get to know them as people 
and you will realise what good friends they can be. The more we open our homes, churches and schools to those seeking sanctuary, the more we will be blessed. Even simple acts of welcome can mean a great deal to those who have gone through so much. I chose to be a refugee in the UK because I found the place here safe. Someone who helped me in Liverpool is called Pastor Cunningham. I saw him recently and he said to me, You forgot something. What is it? Remember this. You were able to survive in England because you were helped by people. So before you leave, you must help. I, I, I don't have much money. It does not matter how much you have. Give. And I gave. I'm not going to tell you the amount I gave, but I gave something. So my advice to you is, whenever you can help, help. Because if you help one man, that man will help another, and that man will help another one. And we will all end up with a better environment to live in. As we said at the beginning, all these stories are true. Michael, Jorah, William, and many more like them come to our country looking for a place of safety. Imagine if tomorrow you had to run away from your home and family because it wasn't safe to stay. What kind of place would you be looking for? A place of safety and protection. A place of comfort, warmth and shelter. A place of welcome and acceptance. Would you find that place here in Bradford? We, we hope, hope so. so. I came, I came to London to fetch my sick daughter to take her home. My daughter, she died, she has the right to stay here, but it's not safe for me to go down home. And I'm looking for a place, a place of sanctuary, where I can think, I can know, I can be where I can hold my head up, where I can be me May not ever feel like home, cause I am a refugee From London I came, I came to Liverpool To ask if I can stay, to ask for asylum But I was sent here falsely, I must travel on it's not safe for me to go down home And I'm looking for a place, a place of sanctuary Where I can think, I can know, I can be free Where I can hold my head up, where I can be me May not ever feel like home, cause I am a refugee Liverpool I came, I came to London Where maps are free but dreams they're costly Where the streets and the weather and the welcome are frosty But it's not safe for me to go down home And I'm looking for a place, a place of sanctuary Where I can think, I can know came to Croydon, Croydon is the place of England's freedom tree. Three hours without a break, they interrogate me. But it's not safe for me to go down home, and I'm looking for a place, a place of sanctuary, where I can
can think, I can know, I can be free Or I can hold my head up where I can be me May not ever feel like home cause I am a refugee From Croydon I came, I came to Margate Detention while they check what they're not believing Though some have their torture stories written on their skin But it's not safe for me to go down home And I'm looking for a place, place of sanctuary Where I can think, I can know, I can be free Where I can hold my head up I came, I came to Bradford, living in limbo, it's a strange kind of dance, always moving, wondering if you've got a chance, but it's not safe for me to go down home, and I'm looking for a place, a place of sanctuary, where I can think, I can know, I can be I came, but I can't go home